So welcome to part two of the lecture. Um, we concluded the last part of the lecture asking the question, to what extent are we, um, as observers, able to simply report the facts of the social world, right? Um, we're part of this social world. We're part of the society we live in. So it may not be very straightforward or easy for us to uh, uh, report on something we're already part of. Why is that? Well, in the example that we use with the phrenologists, or even earlier than that, the example that we used vis-a-vis -vis Aristotle's question on the nature of women, the point is that he was looking at women probably as scientifically as he could, but, uh, you know, he was part of a society that already had these views on women, uh, just the same as the phrenologists were already part of a racist society. And so it wasn't very easy for them to filter out their um, deep assumptions about the nature of the world they were living in, what we've called earlier unconscious ideology. In fact, then that raises a question for us living today. To what extent are we able to filter out the things that we don't know about ourselves, um, the prejudices and assumptions that we might have? On the screen, uh, we ask the question, can we really have a value-neutral political science? And um, just as Max Weber wants us to be objective about politics, to just merely report on the political facts of the world around us, the question is, um, you know, can we actually can we actually do that? Can we really be objective about human affairs? The images on the screen are designed to help us think about just that question. They are called Gestalt images. And they're helpful for us because they show us that the truth is sometimes very ambiguous. Um, for these images to make sense, as you can look at them now, we have to participate in them. In other words, we can't just observe them as if sitting back and watching them is all that we will do. What we don't realize is that we ourselves are actively involved in uh, the knowledge making about the objects we're looking at. These objects are designed to help us reveal just the extent to which we are involved in observing um, their truth. Uh, in the first object, we see what looks at first glance maybe to appear to be a vase, but if our eyes flicker around for a minute or two, we can see that there is also the appearance of two faces coming together to embrace in a kiss. The second image is a little bit more tricky for some people, but if you look closely, you see an old woman or a young woman turning her head. Now, <clears throat> what is the truth about these images? Can we just simply report, as Max Weber would have us do, about their nature? Um, not clearly so, because um, truth is necessarily, um, and, and we're seeing this here, something that we're imposing on them. In other words, it's partial to our experience. Um, we talk about partiality as a form of prejudice, and indeed our bias, and indeed here it is the case that the, our interpretation of these images is partial to us. What is the truth of these images? not everyone's going to agree. For some person, they're just not going to be able to see the other image. Uh, for other people, they won't be able to see the first image that you're able to see. So, uh, and for some people, indeed, there's going to be people who claim to be able to see both images at the same time, although I must confess, I myself, I'm not able to do that. But the point is that what you see depends on where you stand. We cannot easily remove ourselves from the analysis just as the phrenologists could not easily remove themselves from their analysis. And so we might look back at them today and say they were racist, and indeed, from our point of view, they were. From their point of view, they were being scientific. What's the truth? Um, you know, gladly or happily, excuse me, we live in a world where people like that don't get to make decisions today. Uh, we would all prefer to be living, I think, today in a non-racist racist society. But back then, uh, these things were still very much up for grabs and uh, people like that could uh, make, come up with theories and ideas about humans, human nature and human society um, that, you know, today would, uh, in our view, correctly at least, uh, result in them being called cuckoo or, or worse, fascist even. In this slide, we turn to the painting of uh, René Magritte, um, who also helps us um, navigate some of these questions and 
anyone who's taken one of my courses before knows that I often like to turn to art to try to explain some of the things that we're talking about. And so too in this lecture I have a couple of pieces of art, just like the Gestalt uh, diagrams earlier, uh, to try to um, explain some of the aspects of what we're looking at here. So. Um, René Magritte uh, was a, a painter. He was a painter in the realist style, but he was not himself a realist. Um, he questioned the nature of representation itself, and you can see um, on the image here that he was trying to really challenge, I guess, this idea, as the Gestalt images can similarly do, try to challenge this idea of of uh, uh, an ability of us as observers to simply sit back and observe the truth of the objects that we're looking at. As, as we're looking at this painting, René Magritte's painting, we find that as we might try to get a good um, reading here on what's going on in this painting, the painting fights back and and we have to negotiate it with it. In other words, the painting forces us to become directly involved in its interpretation and forces us to concede at the end of the day that we are ultimately partners with it in making its truth. Let's have a look at this painting now for a minute. Uh, we see on the one hand that um, it, it, it seems to be a canvas mounted on an easel. Clearly somebody's been painting a scene outside their window. Yet when we look more closely, some questions arise. Why are the clouds um, that are floating by outside in the window directly uh, relating to what's uh, uh, portrayed on the canvas? Surely a painting is frozen in time. So how on earth could those clouds be in exactly the right place? Um, it's completely, completely improbable that the clouds would ever come by the same way twice. We're smart enough to know that clouds don't do the same thing ever twice in a row. They're always different. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, it appears immediately that to be the case that what's going on here is that the painting is not in fact a painting. It looks like actually perhaps it's made of glass and it's not a painting at all. But if it's made of glass, there's a second question that emerges. If you look to the left of the painting, you see that in fact where glass uh, would reveal continuity of the curtain, um, the painting canvas breaks the continuity of the curtain line. Um, so if it was glass, we should be able to see curtain there, but we can't. So that really creates a psychological problem for us, because on the one hand, to the left of the painting, it's behaving like a painting. But if we look at the clouds, clearly it's not behaving like a painting at all. So it defies our logic. Now what René Magritte is asking us to do here is to think about the nature of representation as we've been discussing it. We think that the Gestalt images are representations of truth. We think that art is a representation of the truth. We think that the alignment of proportions on a skull is a representation of a truth, when actually we find that we as viewers, um, our observers, um, are forced by all of these objects to recognize our own histories, to recognize our own culture, to recognize our own prejudices and our background, and our role ultimately at the end of the day in making meaning. And so Magritte is forcing us to admit that the viewer is never passive. In a way, he's replying, isn't he, to Max Weber and saying that it's never possible to really simply report on the facts. Why? Because we never just see facts, we are participants in making them. Um, so why is this important? Well, you might say um, some of this is very irrelevant, really, and, and, you know, obviously we can't go around with these sort of very deep and nuanced investigations about everything in the world around us. I mean, there has to be some truth, right? Well, you know, fair enough. A lot of the truths we know are obviously true enough that we can neg negotiate and navigate the world around us without too much trouble. But be careful, because where some people might see one truth, others might see another. And we have these problems in the natural world, of course. We call it science, and scientists have debates and contestations all the time. They have they, Their truths are contested, even in the natural world. Um, doctors will disagree um, about um, how patients should be treated. Uh, we know that's true because if we look at our own histories and relationships to doctors, many of us will have gone to different doctors to get what they call a second opinion. So even in the natural scientific world, it's not unusual to see people disagreeing. But when it comes to society, many of these uh, controversies become very, very serious indeed, and uh, they become very political, more to the point. 
So it is relevant for us to look at artwork to try to think about some of these ideas about how the facts of the world, just as the facts of this painting, are difficult to understand and difficult to report on without acknowledging our own role. So too, the facts of the social world are difficult to acknowledge without uh, thinking about uh, uh, our own role in their process of being uh, put together. So uh, let's have a look at the next slide now, um, which is another piece of art. This time it's by Diego Velázquez. It's uh, a 17th century painting of the Spanish royal house. Um, there's a lot of really strange things going on in this painting. It's very interesting in that sense. Um, the central figure, um, as we know from uh, analysis, is uh, the five-year-old princess, or Infanta Margarita, uh, who's the daughter of Philip IV of Spain. Now, there's a lot of things we can observe about this painting. In fact, there's three interesting things from a historical point of view, and I'll talk about them if you want. Um, first, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting painting because unlike many paintings uh, historically for its period, it seems to just show our, an unremarkable and ordinary view of everyday life in the royal household. It's an unusual painting in that sense. You might say it's a snapshot of an everyday moment. Most royal paintings seem to be rather grand and rather, um, uh, you know, um, uh, ostentatious, you know. Um, but here we're just seeing a very ordinary scene. Um, the second um, uh, point that we can raise about this painting is the fact that if we look carefully, we see in the background um, that the painting contains within it some paintings. And um, actually, if we analyze these paintings, we can find out exactly what those paintings are. They are, con they are real life paintings in their own right, and they're considered famous and um, great examples of high art from the period. So clearly this painting is play, paying homage to uh, these arts, uh, these very sort of um, exalted uh, works of art. The third thing we can say about uh, this painting is that it's very mysterious. It's kind of a paradoxical painting. Um, it is uncertain to us looking at it, who is the uh, viewer and who is the viewed? In other words, who is the subject and who is the object that the painter is painting? What's Velázquez up to here? Um, in a sense, the, you know, the more we look at it, one of the things that starts to emerge is that there's a mirror in the background. And the mirror here is a kind of a trap, right? Because it ought to project the rear, the background, the back of what we're looking at, the backs of the people's heads, but we don't see those heads in there. Clearly, we could interpret the painting as a mirror, as containing a mirror, um, and the painter uh, working on a big easel there, is trying to paint, hypothetically, the people or the couple that's revealed in the mirror. So it's a kind of a weird uh, painting in that way. It's deliberately playing with us. Um, we might, looking at it, you know, half expect to see ourselves in that painting, right? Of course, because we're looking at it and in the line of sight of the couple, um, standing between the couple, and the mirror. So it should be us at the back of the Princess Margarita's head or something like that, or even a bit of Velázquez. They should all be appearing in that mirror there. So that causes us maybe to even doubt that it's a mirror at all. Maybe it's a window. Um, we just don't know. Um, but uh, clearly um, there's a sense of discomfort that we get from looking at the painting in this sense. We're not sure if we're the observer of the are the observed. Uh, we're not sure um, why it is that we're not somewhere in the painting. We're caught like ghosts, invisible ghosts, somehow between the object that Velázquez is really looking at and the object that he's painting for us. And this creates a huge sort of philosophical um, uh, paradox for us in our minds. And the painting becomes very awkward to look at in that sense. Now, um, I can give you a quote about this painting from the French philosopher Michel Foucault. He said of it, uh, we are looking at a picture here in which the painter is in turn looking out at us. A mere confrontation, eyes catching one another's glance, direct looks superimposing themselves upon one another as they cross, and yet this slender line of reciprocal visibility embraces a whole complex network of uncertainties, exchanges, and feints. The painter is turning his eyes towards us only insofar as we happen to occupy the same position as his subject. In other words, that we're kind of like ghosts in the painting. 
and yet we're ghosts that are fundamentally involved almost by accident of our virtual place in relation to the painting we're, we're kind of accidentally involved in it which is just a really fascinating way to describe the painting I think all these superimposing glances and we're kind of caught in a crossfire of eyes looking at the royal couple behind us but also perhaps looking at us as well we just don't know there's a lot of ambiguity in the painting and for that reason um, we're, we're troubled by it Foucault also said though um, and this would apply to the Magritte painting that we just looked at in the slide before as well, that perhaps there exists in this painting by Velázquez the representation, as it were, of classical representation itself. In other words, um, uh, on the one hand, it is a painting, it's so realistic, it looks really photorealistic, <clears throat> it's very, very accurate, it's a it's a masterpiece, if if you will, and it seems to engage in this sort of um, playful attitude, however, to uh, classical representation. On the one hand, we can be the observer, we can just sort of sit back and passively look at it, but as we try to do that, um, our hope for that sort of classical representation, this is what Weber was talking about in his definition of political science, that we should be the man of science, right? We should report the facts. F Foucault is saying here, in calling the painting the representation of classical representation he's also saying that it's playing with classical representation he's showing in fact in this painting that max weber's hopes and optimism for a political science for any kind of a science really i suppose are quite um overly exaggerated and that um oftentimes we are as the observer uh, heavily involved in um in making the truth of what it is we're looking at now, <clears throat> now, um, uh, in the last uh, uh, part of this lecture, um, I distinguished for you between objects of the natural world and objects of the social world. And I think that distinction is important to return to here again. Um, in the first image here, uh, we see uh, a bunch of bumblebees, toy bumblebees, hanging from a twig. And this is, of course, a toy, a plastic object, uh, what we call a hanging mobile, that we can hang above a cot or some other uh, place where a baby might be sleeping or um, lying on its back and able to look up at these bumblebees. Now, babies, as we know, love uh, shapes and they love textures. And so um, when a baby is looking at this object, that's pretty much what a baby's going to see. Um, uh, objects that seem to be twirling around in motion uh, with patterns on them and, um, and sort of a baby would maybe be tempted to play with this object. Now an adult looking down at this hanging mobile is going to see um, a hanging mobile. Um, the, the baby and the adult are not able to communicate with each other about the nature of this object. Yet, someday the baby will be grown up. And when the baby's grown up, the adults, the two adults at this stage, can have a conversation about the nature of this object. Um, in other words, that the object, a natural object, will someday uh, be describable by them both um, as a hanging mobile, a plaything. Um, the baby did not know that when it was young, but it knows that now that it's an adult. I want you to contrast that in your minds with the other object portrayed here on this screen, which is a social object, not a natural object. Of course, um, the, the items demonstrated and revealed to us in the second image are made of bricks and mortar and glass and iron, and we see some smoke, and, and we can all agree about the natural nature of those things. But of course, this image is also very symbolic, isn't it? It's a famous image. It's the image of the World Trade Center towers burning. In fact, it's an image that we saw at the very start of this lecture uh, in the title slide, Singing Our World Into Existence. So the question is, what song was sung into existence um, when uh, this object was being shown all around the world on television screens? Interestingly, there were very different songs sung depending on the part of the world that you were in. Here in the United States, the truth that was sung, if you will, the story that was told, the web that was spun about these objects was that they were an act of terrorism. But elsewhere in the world, the song that was sung, the story that was told, was that this was a great strike back for a kind of payback, if you will, uh, or a victory perhaps, a sign of resistance, um, a great victory. Um, so, um, you know, uh, here, a social object, the question is, what's the truth? Well, the truth is 
I guess, depends on who you're asking. Um, a truth comes from a point of view when it comes to social objects. And a social point of view or a social experience is required in order to be able to interpret them. So the point about social objects then is that they are significant in a social sense. Uh, their meaning is a social meaning. And as a result, we cannot expect people to always agree about their nature. People tend to see these things very differently. And so our point here is that there's no view from nowhere here. Um, science, uh, Max Weber asks us to have a view from nowhere, to leave our baggage at the door, to pretend we don't have a viewpoint. But when it comes to politics, when it comes to social life, it appears that we do always have a bias. We do always have a point of view. It's inevitable. And, and uh, even though we think we might be being very objective, in fact, it's just very, very hard to do. Now, in this slide, we see another social object. One I wanted to show you, and the question here, of course, is, well, you know, if Max Weber was in the room with us, how would we report on this image? Well, um, the, the reality is that this is actually a very difficult object to describe. Now, it has certain natural facts um, represented uh, in it. Uh, there's data, right? We see that's world population arranged by income. There's the richest fifth of the planet's population. And we have four other fifths, including the poorest fifth of the planet's population and a representation of the income of each. We see at the top of this image that looks kind of like a champagne glass, the richest fifth of the planet's population gets 82.7% of total world income. 82.7% of total world income. And the poorest fifth receives 1.4% of total world income. But what truth emanates from this image? For some people, they might say, and these are people who may, for example, believe in the free market, who believe in um, the idea that uh, each person should sort of fend for themselves in this world, and that if you're poor, it's probably because you're lazy, and if you're rich, it's probably because you work hard and that you deserve it. So people with that perspective would say that this is an image where uh, we see indicated clearly that there's a whole bunch of people on the planet that are working really hard, and a whole bunch of people on the planet that are not working that hard at all and that they should do be they should be doing more because they deserve their poverty um, uh, to some extent be their, their, their efforts are not um, you know entrepreneurial enough um, from another perspective however perhaps from a more historical perspective the image portrayed on the screen um, is one uh, that clearly um, has um, a whole bunch of complexity associated with it, questions that must be asked and answers that must be sought. Um, uh, after all, is it not the case that the poorest parts of the world, where this 1.4% of income is earned, are parts of the world that were formerly colonies, um, who had raw materials that were extracted and perhaps continue to be extracted by wealthy Western countries and corporations, um, often making great profit from uh, these resources in the process. Um, that uh, the Western world is largely represented in the top fifth is an interesting observation because the Western world was the place where the empires used to be. The empires, of course, got a tremendous head start in their overall development, historically speaking, and they still sit on top of that advantage today. They still have the material advantage, the roads that were built, the maps that were made, the science that was developed, the inventions and technologies that were conceived and traded. Um, all of these things, uh, you know, uh, stand as the inheritance of the Western world. But was that inheritance gained fairly and squarely through merit, through hard work? No, in fact, we see that it was gained through imperialism and exploitation of the people in the poorest fifth of the planet. So the two interpretations that we can uh, generate uh, just off our cuffs here um, in relation to, to this image are, are quite starkly different, aren't they? Um, so this is not a natural object like the mobile hanging above the child's uh, cot. In fact, it's a social object and it's, um, uh, it's reasonable to expect that people will have strong disagreements about its nature uh, depending on their point of view, depending on the world that they see. Now, in this image, um, I want to talk to you quickly about the question, um, can we have a science that explains world politics? Some international relations theorists will say yes, we can. 
um, others will say no. But let's just look uh, right now at the people who do believe that it is possible to have a science. These are, if you will, the Max Webers of international relations theory. And our course is very much associated with international relations theory because um, globalization tends to be studied by people who have a background in that. So, so um, one very popular um, 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 perspective in international relations and in globalization theory as well is that the world is populated by nation states that have a kind of a rationality or a reason to them, much the same as individual human beings have a rationality and reason to them. Um, now, this is a very interesting um, um, uh, idea, right? Um, because it suggests that if we're going to analyze the interactions between nation states, we could borrow a lot from how we analyze the interactions between uh, human beings. So how do we make that move? Well, how do we justify the idea that nation states are people? Um, well, rational choice international relations theorists justify that argument on the basis of what they call the three S's. Um, on the one hand, we have statism, and then we have survival, and then we have self-help. So let me break those down for you now. Statism, statism basically is the principle that while many human beings come together in all different kinds of groups, not all of those groups are equal. In fact, one particular kind of group has a kind of a magic pixie dust sprinkled on it, which turns it from a regular group into something above and beyond any type of group um, that can exist apart from itself. And that is sovereignty. Groups that have sovereignty are, by definition, states. They have state power. So what is sovereignty? Well, sovereignty is something we're going to get into defining in more detail later in the course. But for now, you should think about it very simply as the ability to have a monopoly over the armed use of force within the country that you're considering. Um, so if I have the army at my disposal, I can maintain a certain coherency of my group, right? Anyone who tries to break away from the group, I can try to punish them. Um, anyone who breaks the laws of that group, I can try to punish them. And I cannot be challenged. Right, um, because after all, uh, unless you have an army too, um, you can, you know I, I de facto am the the ruler of the land. Of course, if you do have an army, you may challenge me, and then we have a civil war. But then we have two countries. So you see, um, the relationship between the sovereign and the army is very very clear. Once you have an army and the monopoly over that armed force, you have a country. If someone else comes along and develops their own army, then you have a de facto state of civil war. Um, now. Now that we know that human beings come together in states and states have sovereignty and that's very important in terms of maintaining their coherency, the question is um, what do those these coherent objects desire? You know, if, if, if they have a sort of a, a brain, um, they hold together, they're, they're what, what we call sometimes corporate, corporate bodies, bodies that exist through the corporation of many, many people working together, the incorporation, excuse me, then what is their goal? Um, well, we might say their goal is to survive. Just like people, nation states have one goal that really prevails above all other goals, and that is the goal to survive. Just like you and I, we might want to grow up to be a computer programmer or an opera singer or a dentist. It doesn't matter about those goals if we don't survive to see our goals lived and experienced. So obviously survival is the primary good through which all the other good things that we want to accomplish in our lives uh, are to be achieved. So the nation state has the same same goal. For all the people to survive, for the nation state to continue to exist, it has to take care of the people, it has to take care of their lives, it has to make sure that they continue to exist, that they're fed, that they're healthy, or the state dies, it ceases to exist. So clearly, just as you and I have the goal to survive, so too the nation state, even though it doesn't really exist outside of the interaction of the human beings that make it up, it kind of has a personality and that personality wants to survive. Now, how does one survive as a nation state? Well, unfortunately, nation states suffer a condition that us as individuals living within the nation state don't seem to suffer as much. Living within the nation state, we have institutions, courts and police forces that we can turn to to help us in our dealings with one another. If you cheat me, if you try to, um, to, to break a contract or a promise with me, there's a good chance that I can take you to court and that I can prosecute you in the court. Nation states don't have that recourse. They live in the condition of anarchy. 
And in order to survive in anarchy, anarchy of course breaks down into the uh, double concept of living without laws, um, or um, without laws, excuse me, not a double concept, I, sh I, I misspoke. Um, but anarchy, uh, if you break that down, the, the, the meaning of that word, the origin of that word is living is, is, is without laws. Um, then, you know, think about what that means for the relationship between nation states. Um, transcendent above the nation states that exist above the world is nothing. Transcendent above us is government, is the sovereign government of our land that makes sure that contracts and promises are respected among the citizens. But above the nation states of planet Earth, there is no transcendent government. There is only the empty vacuum of the space between them. So our nation states have nothing to turn to. There's no police force. There's no court to which they can appeal their disputes um, in, in hope of having those disputes resolved. So if you can't trust anyone, who can you trust? Where do you do? What do you do? What's your, what's your best chance of achieving your primary goal, which is to survive? Well, as they say, the, 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 the best chance is through what we call self-help, helping yourself. So on the strength of these three S's, statism, survival, and self-help, rational choice international relations theorists believe that it is possible to make certain generalizations um, with a kind of scientific um, sort of certainty about them, about the nature um, of the world that our nation states on a global basis inhabit. Okay, And so uh, we can be, in their view, somewhat scientific about the nature of the world that we're living in because of these uh, generalizations and their reliability in the long run. Now importantly, just by the way, if you were a governmental advisor, it's like, like the famous Henry Kissinger, for example, a statesman, um, if you were a statesman, how would you advise the president um, if this was the world that you were living in? You know, if you if you had been trained to think about these three S's, well, arguably one of the things you'd be doing is you'd be making sure that the state was always prepared for conflict. If you can't trust any of the other states out in the world, the only way you can really guarantee that your way of life will survive is through the ability to have a large army uh, and to be able to use that army at a moment's notice. Um, so. Um, obviously nation states are going to have to make sacrifices for the greater good, aren't they? They're going to have to be able to do some cruel and nasty things in order to be able to survive. So you see here a, a perspective, a very scientific perspective, you might say, because it's based on these general generalities of the three S's, um, can lead to a conclusion um, uh, um, made by statesmen who advise and recommend the president and the other members of government that, you know, the world out there is a dangerous place and we need to have a big army in order to be able to deal with the things that it's going to throw at us. Now another way to explain that schematically is um, to uh, create this uh, metric here, uh, a two by two metric, uh, which explains to us what we call the prisoner's dilemma. And this prisoner's dilemma is famously something that uh, explains the utility, or if you will, the amount of points that two prisoners are going to award to different options that are confronting them um, when they're in this particular scenario. And the scenario is this. Two captives faced with the option of cooperating with or betraying one another will always choose the latter. Why? Because it's the best option given in the circumstances. Um, so here we have prisoner A and prisoner B. Prisoner A's functions, um, the points he's going to allocate to the various decisions he wants to make. Um, uh, are going to be represented in, in the pale color, the pale uh, white color, and then prisoner B's um, uh, uh, preferences are going to be explained using the blue color. And the prisoners um, can either cooperate with each other or betray each other. Now the prisoner's dilemma is a very popular theory in international relations. Uh, it states that in the international system is anarchic, right? That, for, that it forces the nation states to rely on self-help if they want to survive. Similarly, our prisoners here are in a situation where they're in a kind of an anarchic structure, right? Even if they know each other really well, even if they're good friends, the reality is they've been detained by the police and offered a kind of deal um, that makes it um, uh, very uh, possible that uh, they will want to break each other's promises to each other and betray each other to the police. So the two men are arrested, but the police, of course, don't possess enough information for a conviction. Following the separation of the two men, the police offer both men a similar deal. 
and you see the deal represented here on the screen. Um, if one testifies against his partner, that I, he, he betrays his partner, and the other remains silent, the police say, then they'll let the betrayer go free, and the cooperator will receive a one-year sentence. Um, or even uh, here, as we, sorry, in the, in the screen I meant, uh, it, it says death. Um, if both remain silent, both are sentenced to only one month in jail for a minor charge. Um, if each rats each other out, they each receive a three-month sentence. Each prisoner must choose either to betray or to remain silent. The decision of each is kept quiet, but what should they do, right? So, prisoner A is sitting here in the prison, and uh, he knows that if he squeals, he'll go free, and his partner will be killed. And he might say, well, you know, I don't want to kill my partner. Um, even if I could have freedom here, I don't want to do that. But on the other hand, what does my partner think? That's what's going on in my mind, you know? What is my partner's brain process like at this stage? Do I think that he would take the freedom and then put me to death? Can I afford to take that risk? So maybe um, I don't want to kill my partner, but I certainly don't want him to kill me. I don't. Maybe I don't know him that well. So even though I'm probably a good person in some way, shape, or form, I don't know that my partner is a good person. I just don't have enough information to be sure about it, about it at this time. So the least uh, worst option for me is to betray him, assuming that he might betray me. Meanwhile, over in the other cell, the exact same reflection is going on in the mind of prisoner B. And so you see the two prisoners, because they don't really fully understand what's going on in the mind of the other, um, have to choose the least worst option for themselves. And you can look at how using a very basic system of, of assigning numbers to the different um, uh, preferences, with four being the greatest preference and one being the lowest preference, that the prisoners tend to have a combined uh, point function of four. That is to say, they both betray each other. It's not their highest preference by any means, but it's better than death. They'll go for um, the option that gives them two points, two points each. Now, is that an optimal amount of points? Um, the prisoners, if they'd agreed with each other, could have both gotten three points each for a combined utility of six. Instead, they have a combined utility of four. Now, there are, of course, fives available as combined utility, but neither of those options were available because of the logic of the structure of the situation that they were in. Each, of course, knew that the other was likely to betray each other, or possibly able to betray each other, and so therefore had to opt for the least worst option. So it's that's the important term that we should come away from with this, that, that international relations, the relations between nation states is very much like the relation between these prisoners. And nation states, even if they're nice countries, even if they're democratic liberal states, often have to do bad things, not because they're bad countries, but because anarchy makes them do it. Anarchy creates a shadow of the future, as they call it, whereby they're not able to anticipate or understand the future intentions and actions of their partners in the society, in the international society, if you will, that they're living in. So the least worst option tends to be the outcome, and we call this the tragedy of international relations, right? The tragedy of great power politics. Now, um, this seems to be, on the strength of it, a very scientific theory indeed. But the key question here is history. As presented in this theory, there's much that we don't know that could actually be quite helpful for us. It is, after all, a scenario, is it not? It's just a scenario. And it seems very scientific based on the hypotheses that we've put forward so far. But let's think about those actual prisoners. Are the prisoners guilty? Um, are they really in a prisoner's dilemma? Do the prisoners know each other? Have they, for example, been trained? Are they military officers, for example, that might have been trained to be able to withstand these kinds of interrogation techniques by the police? Are they um, uh, religious fundamentalists of some sort that believe that they would go to hell if they would betray their religious comrade? So there's real questions that emerge here that have to be answered by people who are working with this scenario, the prisoner's dilemma scenario. Um, uh, finally, I guess the main question here is that really the prisoner's dilemma is just a story among many other stories. So does the prisoner's dilemma capture the story, for example, of the feelings of friendship between the USA and Canada or the USA and Britain? 
we might say it captures the relationship between the USA and North Korea or the USA and Iran quite well, but those other countries, Canada and Britain, are actually friends. Now, does Britain uh, materially present more or less of a threat than Iran? Well, right now in American media, for example, we're very worried about Iran getting nuclear weapons. But the scientists are telling us that nuclear weapons probably won't be able to be developed in Iran for another 15 plus years, that they're very, very far away from being able to develop nuclear weapons. Whereas Britain has nuclear weapons, has nuclear submarines to be able to deliver nuclear missiles all over the United States eastern seaboard and could actually probably take out a significant chunk of this country. Yet Americans don't go to sleep at night worrying about Great Britain and their nuclear weapons. Why is that, right? How does the prisoner's dilemma explain that to us? It can't really. And so that brings us back to the question that we've been raising this whole lecture so far, right? Um, it does matter if you're committed to a science, right? But if you're scientific, how sure are you that your personal biases and your personal opinions are clouding or not your way of looking at the world? Um, arguably, um, to, um, to, to, to embrace something like the prisoner's dilemma uh, can be very seductive uh, because it does appear to be uh, very scientific in some ways, but as we know, um, it's just a story. And um, just as Velázquez's painting is a story, or uh, Magritte's painting is also a story, we have to acknowledge our own role in it. So it's not to say the prisoner's dilemma is wrong, but it's to say that it's just one story and might not explain the relationship between all nation states. Uh, we might need to look to other theories to get a clear or accurate representation of what's going on in those relationships. So in this slide, in this slide, um, we ask ourselves the question of what it means to think about security as a social object. In the last slide, we mentioned Henry Kissinger, uh, and here he is again. Uh, Henry Kissinger, as a statesman, believes that security can be understood in tanks and jet fighters and nuclear weapons. And so, as a strategist of security, as a statesman, his job, uh, trained as he was by rational choice theorists, was to try to uh, appraise the world in terms of its anarchy and the need of the United States to survive um, and survive against military aggression specifically. But what does a theory that is focused on that kind of reality have to offer um, the sort of person represented in the second image? This actually happens to be a woman in Darfur. Um, and a few years ago, uh, Darfur was, of course, um, uh, the place where some terrible ethnic cleansing activities were going on. In fact, some people went so far as to call it a genocide. And many people debate to this day whether that's actually the case. But either way, something terrible was going on there. There were people coming from the north, driven out by famine and, and arid desert conditions um, to try to find new land. And the nation state favored those people, the, the state of um, Sudan, where Darfur is. Darfur is a region of Sudan. And the Sudanese government was giving privileges to the people from the north because they liked them. And the people in Darfur were not considered to have very high status. So. Interestingly enough, in this situation, the armed forces of the nation state, which we, which Henry Kissinger would say are for the defense of the nation state and the greater good and longevity of the nation state, were being turned inwards on the people who lived there in, in this project of ethnic cleansing. And so the question is, for the person portrayed in the second image, would the objects described by Henry Kissinger um, meet her definition of security? I put beside the images of her a sack of rice and a blue helmet, the blue helmet famously being the helmet worn by the United Nations peacekeepers. It seems to me that um, uh, the woman in the picture would very unlikely uh, take the view, uh, would be very unlikely to take the view um, that a jet fighter has anything much to do with her personal security. Her primary concern was food and the aggression of the nation state she was living in. So the question of security then um, has very different perspectives to, uh, to, that we can bring to bear in addressing it. And uh, not all of them, um, by any means, are described by what we've been calling here the rational choice IR theorists, like Henry Kissinger. In our slide here, 
uh, we see um, the women referred to in the textbook as the women of Greenham Common. Uh, this is in the Edkins and Zaphis textbook here where we see the protesters forming a 14-mile human chain from Greenham Common Air Base to Bergfield Ordnance Station. If we take the view of the statesman in relationship to security, we always want to have strong army, a strong army and, and the best weapons we can possibly have. But not everyone follows that view, as we can imagine, because we've just looked at the women of Greenham Common, are, are the women in Darfur. Here, the women in Greenham Common are also challenging in their own way that view of security. The famous Greenham Common Peace Camp began in September of 1981 after a Welsh group called Women for Life on Earth arrived at Greenham to protest the decision of the government to allow cruise, cruise missiles to be based there. Cruise missiles can carry nuclear weapons. Two years later, on the 1st of April uh, 1983, uh, tens of thousands of protesters were joining with those women. They had obviously, their cause had become popular over time and they formed a 14 mile human chain from Greenham Common uh, to, to Bergfield in order to uh, make uh, the government aware of the fact that they did not want nuclear weapons being stored at this location. In fact it was a US Army base at Greenham and um, people were there were involved in anti-nuclear uh, war campaigning and they didn't want uh, to be uh, complicit, involved in supporting. You know, sometimes people look at not saying anything as a form of support, right? If you say nothing, then people will just go on and do what they want to do without changing anything. And that's what the Green women of Greenham Common were trying to change and trying to prevent happening. So what does this tell us? In the conclusion of this lecture, we can say a few things that we've learned. And we're going to summarize our lecture uh, just as the chapter that we're looking at uh, refers to the writings and thinking of Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci tells us that we are all in what he calls common sense. We're all located in common sense, even scientists. Think about that in relation to everything we've been saying so far about unconscious ideology and culture. Um, Gramsci uh, offers us this famous quote, We are all, he says, the product of historical processes to date, which have deposited in us an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. Well, think about it for a minute. What better way to refer to or think about what we've called so far in this lecture, unconscious ideology. The ideology that we have within us, the political assumptions that we have in us, by virtue of our socialization, by virtue of our history, which we don't know we have, i.e. that has not left a calling card, or in Gramsci's terms, that has not left an inventory, right? Um, there's countless, countless assumptions circulating in our mind, and we need those assumptions. We're not here to say that assumptions about the world around us are intrinsically always bad. Human beings need to make assumptions in order to be able to get along in the world. I have to be able to assume that when I swing my legs out of bed in the morning that the floor is going to be there and I'm not going to float up into space, right? If I was dubious about that proposition, I'd be a very anxious person all the time. Um, so what is Gramsci really offering us here except um, a really interesting and provocative uh, quote uh, to help us think about some of the concepts that we've been trying to address in this class so far. Isn't he in a way saying what Stephen Colbert is also saying in his joke about truthification? Um, that truthification is really, really complex, that there's a lot of variables, i.e. what he calls traces, involved in making us who we are. We talked about five or six of them in the first part of this lecture that are involved in truthification. Um, but Gramsci, of course, simply calls this history, and he says that there's a lot of traces, a lot of, a lot of variables that leave marks, if you will, in our imaginations about the world in this unconscious manner. Does this mean there's no hope of science? Does this mean that we should just give up trying to think about society or analyze it in any way, shape or form at all? No, I don't think that's what Gramsci is saying. We do have a certain ability to see common sense, he says, if but only if we use what he calls critical theory. So what is critical theory then? Well, critical theory is the ability for, for Gramsci to be able to stand back from this infinity of traces, to stand back from this unconscious ideology, to stand back from the world for a minute and simply say, I'm not sure that I know what I think I know, to basically just sort of look at it with some fundamental doubt in our minds. And 
to ask instead of trying to analyze it, to ask instead how it came about. What are the ideologies that shape us and mold us and make us who we are today? And maybe by starting that, I get a much better sense of what it is that we need to filter in the first place. So if Weber is asking us for a political science, he's asking the lecturer, the teacher of political science to leave his or her luggage, intellectual, emotional baggage at the door. I think what Gramsci is asking us for by asking us to take a step back from the world instead of getting all enthusiastic and eager to get stuck in and examine it and study it and pull it apart and examine all its little components. Um, Gramsci is asking us for modesty. Weber asks us for political science. Gramsci asks us for modesty or maybe even humility in the face of the reality that we are confronted with. Humility, I think, is a good word here for Gramsci because it asks that we start with ourselves that we start with looking within and we start by trying to ask, well, what can I do um, to, to assess, to survey, um, even within myself, the kinds of historical influences that society has left within me without a calling card, as we say, the unconscious ideologies that shape me and make me who I am. And it's in that spirit, friends, that we end today's lecture. And uh, let me say that uh, in that spirit of modesty, it's something I hope that we can retain as we go forward in this class. I would like for us to be able to take uh, that modesty with us, that humility with us, as we look at each module in the weeks to come. And I hope you enjoy your course. Uh, I enjoy putting these lectures together for you. I'll be seeing you online in the discussion forums where we'll have back and forth conversation about um, the work as we're uh, going through the material. I hope this format works for you, um, but please, don't ever uh, assume that I'm uh, just because you're only seeing me on a screen that you cannot reach me. Um, this should be to the extent that we possibly can make it a two-way conversation. Um, so please do email me. I'm always happy to set up a Skype video chat. And of course, we will uh, be uh, able to uh, meet in person uh, at least on four occasions, possibly five in the course of the semester ahead. And I will look forward to seeing you on those occasions for revision study sessions, etc. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day.